three, two, one, five. When people think of the work done at insurance companies, they probably picture underwriters and actuaries wearing suits and sitting at desks. But at some insurers, research labs, staffed by scientists and engineers, play a vital, if rarely seen, role in discovering ways to reduce losses caused by man-made and natural risks. For commercial property owners, fire is one of the greatest and costliest potential perils. Two of the nation's largest commercial property insurers, Chubb and FM Global, both have labs dedicated to helping clients minimize or avoid fire damage. Welcome to the floor of the Lodge Burn Lab. This is the largest facility of its kind in the world. It's about 70,000 square feet of laboratory space you're standing on. The south pad and the north pad both have movable ceilings above your head. Okay? They're 80 feet by 80 feet, and they travel a distance from 10 feet from the floor to a total height of 60 feet. We can position sprinkler heads to replicate the sprinkler configuration in any of our client facilities. Or we can test sprinkler technology to its limits. At Chubb Insurance's Fire Lab, employees, customers, and fire officials all learn about the proper installation and maintenance of sophisticated fire suppression systems. All our underwriters go through the Fire Lab. And it's very important that for them to understand all the different aspects of protection. Sprinkler systems, smoke detection systems, what kind of alarms can be attached to the sprinkler system. But we also use the fire lab for Chubb policyholders and Chubb producers, allowing them to come in, attend a class, be it basic fire protection or maybe more advanced topics in fire protection. It's hands-on. They get to see how a sprinkler system works. And I think that's the real benefit of the fire lab is how we use it externally. At Liberty Mutual's research lab, one focus is on reducing losses in the commercial trucking fleets the company insures. The test track is designed to give clients a powerful visual demonstration of what a big difference anti-lock brakes can make in preventing accidents. Most common types of, of crash events that we used to suffer was jackknifes. A uh, driver would have to hit the brakes hard in an emergency and the, the first thing the vehicle wants to do is, is jackknife. The average cost of a jackknife, and this was maybe 10 years ago, was about $170,000. And if you think about it, you got a tractor that's worth hundred grand, you got a trailer that's worth twenty grand. It doesn't take much, a little extra property damage to get, to get that much. And that was even if you didn't hit anything. Because anti-lock brakes prevent the wheels from locking, they've prevented probably 80 to 85 percent of jackknives. And, and this has been just phenomenal. Uh, particularly in the, in the commercial vehicle industry. Natural hazards, of course, are a major source of property claims, and FM Global has a lab dedicated to researching ways to mitigate the risks associated with hurricanes, earthquakes, and floods. Its earthquake shake table dramatically shows how investing in the right storage rack can reduce losses. The one on the left is bolted directly to the base of the earthquake shake table. The one on the right has what's called base isolation. The base isolator is bolted. The rack is almost free-floating on there. It runs on roller bearings. And you'll see what happens to that product on those shelves during the earthquake. The base isolated shelving is behaving itself today, barely moving. Now you watch those boxes to the left of the, um, the shelf, and they're all moving at the same speed. They've reached their harmonic. They're doing a little dance. But I think you can see that, you know, base isolation does work. The shelf still stood, the one that was bent, uh, bolted to the floor, so it's usable again after the earthquake passed, but whatever product was stored on there is now broken. People have asked if we give rides on that thing. No, we don't. What you all came for, the really important stuff, firing a 2x4 at a piece of plywood. If you're down in Florida, the people install hurricane shutters and things like that. They're permanently attached to the building. They close them when the storm is approaching. They open them when the storm is passed. But most people, especially in areas that aren't subject to um, hurricane-type activity on a regular basis will use good old-fashioned plywood to protect their doors and windows. Charging. He's going to fire a 2 by 4 at 37 miles per hour at a, piece, a single piece of half-inch plywood. And why half-inch? Because three-quarter or five-inch plywood is expensive and heavy and most people don't want to buy it, so they buy the half-inch. And, and it goes right through. So our order of priority is Order of importance of protecting doors and windows is 5 8 inch plywood, 
doubled up half inch, single half inch, doubled up OSB, single OSB, or keep your fingers crossed and don't do anything, or move to where the wind doesn't blow. Of all the tests National Underwriter witnessed, the most spectacular involved the dust explosion bunker at FM Global's research campus. For manufacturing clients dealing with potentially explosive materials, the lesson in this test is to show that damage limiting construction, such as a blowout wall, which can effectively channel destructive energy in the least harmful direction, can save equipment worth millions of dollars or a facility worth tens of millions. While these research efforts are not inexpensive to run, Chubb, FM Global, and Liberty Mutual all say their labs are great investments, reducing the frequency and severity of claims and helping attract and retain clients who place a premium on preventing losses. We're trying to make these types of events, be it a fire, an explosion, an earthquake, a uh, hurricane, trying to make them a distraction, not a disaster. We want to have our clients be able to recover their normal business operations as quickly as possible following an event. 